I know we've talked about TIG welding before on this channel, but this time it's gonna be different. This time it's going to be all fluff. No, no, don't try adjusting your picture. You heard me right, TIG fluff. We'll take a step back and talk bigger picture and just why exactly I love TIG welding so much. I mean, compared to other welding processes, not compared to say Oreo ice cream or my wife, I guess. When it comes to welding, there's just nothing as versatile as TIG. If it's metal and it's weldable, well, this'll do it. Now, the upfront costs are a little higher. We'll talk about that in a minute, but depending on what you think you're likely to weld, they don't have to be. A very basic DC rig can cover a heck of a lot of bases. The reason I bring this up, why it even dawned on me to talk big picture TIG, were an unusually high number of comments in one of my more recent TIG brazing videos. Comments that demonstrated I wasn't as clear as I could have been. I like to fix stuff. More precisely, I like being able to fix stuff, if I so choose, which I try not to choose that often. Now, not knowing how to fix or make something for that matter is a completely different topic, but not being able to is a whole nother level of infuriating. And right there, my dear friends, in one or two sentences is the psychosis that led me to spending a small fortune on all my tools. TIG welds have always held a very special place in my heart. That's literally speaking. I think of it like the grandchild of oxyacetylene welding, the grandchild that's really good at computers. Without having to endure the internal struggle of whether or not you should just use your lighter because the striker is too far away, with TIG, at the push of a button, the pointy tungsten electrode spits a quietly terrifying blue fire of near silent wanton destruction. Oxyacetylene is somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 degrees Celsius. A TIG arc is three times that easy. And oxyacetylene can do this to steel. I'm getting off topic. TIG welding. So gas, stick, MIG, lasers, plasma, they all have their place and their pros and cons. I prefer and have settled on TIG welding. I don't think anything's ever come through my door that I haven't been able to TIG weld. Though full disclosure, I keep my door closed. From steel to aluminum, from big heavy work to really small detail work, it's really just a matter of changing my settings and grabbing the right filler rod. Thank you. 
all TIG welders can also do stick welding. Just about all the TIG welders I know anyway. So there's that added bonus. Both stick and TIG are constant current processes. The power supply is more or less the same. I do tend to stay away from stick when I can just because of all the smoke and the cleanup and chipping slag, that sort of thing. but I do use it for real heavy stuff when I need it. For example, I built my hydraulic press with stick welds. Now with this TIG welder, I think I could probably pull that off. With the TIG welder I had at the time, I was kind of pushing it. But big picture, for heavy stuff like that, stick or TIG just makes more sense. Though again, it depends how often you're doing that. If you're gonna buy just one welder, if you're making hydraulic presses every day, it might not be TIG. But if you do this as a hobby, or heck, maybe even have a job shop and you don't know what you're gonna be welding, what material, how big, how heavy, the versatility of one of these is just hard to beat. And that's what makes it so appealing to me. Today, I'm wearing an HTP Invertig AC-DC machine. It's what I always wear. It's the only thing in my wardrobe. As the name implies, this does both AC and DC. Just push a button and like magic, it goes from one to the other. I guess I'm only really stopping to tell you this because someone will ask, though I do really like it. Let's talk about what you can weld with just basic DC TIG. No fancy machines, or I guess no fancy functions for that matter. You can do basic DC TIG with a fancy machine. Now these are just pieces I have laying around my garage, so I apologize for the low production quality of my samples. The obvious place to start is steel, I suppose. Any mild or plain carbon steel, anything with low carbon content or medium carbon content, all the way up to high carbon content like a tool steel. This happens to be D3. The higher the carbon content, the more careful you need to be when welding it, the trickier it gets, but certainly weldable. We can put chromoly in with this too, and cast iron. If it's mostly steel, or iron I suppose, your basic DC TIG welder can weld it. Then there's stainless steel, that chemically fits in the same list, but people tend to call that out as different, so we'll do the same. In that family, you could perhaps also add nickel and nickel-based alloys like Inconel. Though once you get into the weldable metals families, you could weld lead, I suppose, and I guess pure zinc if you're making fancy roof ornaments or, I don't know, old-timey buckets. So be careful with that stuff. Zinc, I mean, not old-timey buckets. And then titanium fits in here somewhere. Finally, we have brass, bronze, and copper. Again, I apologize for not having flat, weldy looking stock, but most of my exotic materials happen to be for the machining work. Rounds for the lathe in this case. I didn't do great in chemistry, but I'm pretty sure shape doesn't have any significant impact on the metallurgy. You can weld round copper just as poorly as you can weld flat copper. Again, all of this is done in DC, direct current. So even the most basic TIG welder covers a pretty impressive range of materials. And on top of that, even the cheapest TIG welders do DC just fine. If it turns on and actually works, it should weld in DC just fine. On the cheapest machines, it's never really a question of whether or not it'll weld DC. It's more of a guessing game on if it'll turn on or not when you need it. However, a few caveats. First, we're just talking here. A couple of kids with nothing better to do. Although DC TIG welding is used to join titanium or Inconel and all this stuff, I don't want you to think it's necessarily easy or you're gonna build a space shuttle with just your Harbor Freight welder. But hey, don't ever let anyone tell you what you can and you can't. Second, we're talking specifically about welding these metal to themselves. Steel to steel, copper to copper, so forth, so on, and etc. If you want to start doing genetic experiments and crossbreeding these, there are some combinations that work and some that don't. Some combinations require a lot of care and attention above and beyond the actual welding to keep them from cracking during physical therapy. Which brings us to point three. I think it was three anyway. A lot of these need auxiliary equipment or proper thermal treatment pre, during, and post weld. Titanium, for example, wants a ton of shielding gas. In fact, unless it's just really small parts and short welds, do it in a purge chamber or on the moon. Zinc fumes, for example, can kill you. So sure, you've welded zinc with just DC TIG, but now you're dead. If you've got people waiting for you and you got work to get out the door, you might want to save all your zinc welding for last. Brass is tricky, also has a lot of zinc in it, I think, maybe lead. In fact, there are different flavors of these copper-based alloys, some that weld better than others. Bottom line, there's more in welding than just the right welder. But the right welder, of course, goes a long way. The point of this is to show you what you can do with just DC TIG. I'm sure there's metals that I've completely left out. You can, I think, TIG weld gold and silver, but unfortunately I don't have any of that bar stock on hand. Now, while we're on the topic, this is where TIG brazing fits in. Brazing is not welding. It's a way of joining two pieces using a go-between metal, chemically speaking. 
that in between metal is used to join the dissimilar metals. Metals that otherwise would be impossible or too finicky to actually weld. This is a part I think we did back in the brazing video, and it uses a copper alloy to join these two dissimilar metals. It wets to both metals, but the process doesn't technically fuse the two together. Think of it like really strong glue, glue that works with a DC TIG welder. And lastly, for me anyway, we have aluminum and magnesium. But here now we're talking AC TIG, not DC. Reactive metals like aluminum and magnesium require AC, and that, more often than not, means a more expensive welder. Apples to apples, that is. For example, for the price of a DC-only, say, Fronius brand TIG welder, you can buy almost three of the import AC TIG welders. So... Sentences are complicated. Generally speaking, though, a DC TIG welder will cost less than a comparable quality AC TIG welder. This is getting off topic a bit, talking about machine selection, but it's probably worth noting that there are other complicating factors above and beyond just AC versus DC, such as amperage and duty cycle. A smaller 100 amp TIG welder usually costs less than a larger 300 amp TIG welder. And a machine with a lower duty cycle, or how much time it can weld before melting its own brains out, will cost costs less than a machine with a higher duty cycle. Why yes, thank you, I am pretty good at stating the obvious. That is all to say buying your first TIG welder, or any TIG welder, always takes a bit of homework. But probably the single largest deciding factor is whether you want DC or AC and DC capabilities. Which nicely brings us full circle to my lineup here. A DC welder gets you all of this, and the added cost of AC practically speaking, really only nets you the addition of aluminum and magnesium. Though, depending on what you do, those two can be real biggies. I might have made this too tall. Well, I'll be. I didn't really expect it to be that sturdy. I didn't have any good place in my garage for this little lathe. Constantly moving it from my bench to the floor to the living room and back again was really getting old. Then I had the brilliant idea to add it onto my CNC router. Long term, I plan to CNC this thing and I'd still be using the same computer, monitor, etc. So I know I wanted to keep it close. This also gives me a place to work on it without taking up precious bench space. I plan to tie this frame in more, add some shelving, that sort of thing. But first I wanted to make sure I'm not interfering with the router. Looks like it should do for now, but we'll see if there's any surprises. I reverted to the original gears and installed the chuck shield. All of that will change, but for now my kids have expressed interest in learning to use it, so I thought I'd button it up as best I could and add the shield. My boy's not going to be happy with the solid top slide. I suspect his end game is taper turning for that yet unobtainable, perfectly pointy stick. But we'll see how it goes. I'm glad this thing's found a home and I can slowly start noodling away at it. A couple of updates I thought I'd throw in here that didn't really fit in the rest of the video. You may have noticed I didn't send the TIG button back. It's really started growing on me since last we saw it. It was nice not having to drag the foot controller across the shop to add the lathe frame to the router, for example. Again, it does take some getting used to. I'm not quite there yet. Still feels like I have more control with my foot, but I imagine it's just a matter of more time with it. Second, and perhaps a little anticlimactic, these little wedge collets are really nice. Classic TIG collet, the ones I've always used, look something like this. They're split down their length, and when you tighten the back cap, they flex and tighten down on the electrode. These are solid. They just have sort of an eccentric conical tip. Let me get you in closer. Here's a smaller one of comparable size to the wedge collet. Time to throw that one away, probably. These split collets, traditional collets, so I call them just because that's what I've always used, tend to wear out, lose their springiness. You can see that gap is almost closed there, and they get all twisted. I guess from the heat and pressure of screwing on the back cap, sooner or later they get all deformed and you just throw them away and put in a new one. This wedge collet, on the other hand, doesn't show any signs of slowing down.
With these, when you tighten the back cap, that eccentric cone on the tip sends them all sideways and wedge the electrode in place. What I've really come to like about them though, might sound a bit silly, is they have less trouble with the paint on the back of the tungsten. Electrodes slide right in right out. On the older ones, the traditional ones, there are times when the paint build up's a little too much and they snag and you can't extract the electrode. I've never really tried ripping these out, pulling them too hard. I mean, the parts are relatively small. And sometimes, usually on smaller electrodes, usually when welding aluminum, the tip might ball up too much or you might crash the point. Not me, mind you. And you end up with a ball at one end and paint on the other, effectively trapping your electrode in the collet. And you have to break the whole torch down and sharpen the electrode while it's still in the collet. I don't know, maybe it's just me. It's a coincidence I happen to not crash the electrode as often as I used to, so the new collets seem better. Or I've been using the old collets long past their expiration date, should have been swapping them out more often. Whatever the case, I think I'm gonna stick to buying these wedge style collets. I just wish I would have gotten turned on to them sooner. And on that embarrassing note, it's probably a good place I need to stop. Thanks for watching.